Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Aha! Hi, everyone. Mike TV is sent by television. Mike TV was even more excited than Grandpa Joe at seeing a bar of chocolate being sent by television. But Mr. Wonka, he shouted, "Can you send other things through the air in the same way?" Breakfast cereal, for instance. Oh, my sainted aunt! cried Mr. Wonka. Don't mention that disgusting stuff in front of me. Do you know what breakfast cereal is made of? It's made of all those little curly wooden shavings you find in pencil sharpeners. But could you send it by television if you wanted to, as you do chocolate? Asked Mike TV. Of course I could, and what about people? Asked Mike TV. Could you send a real live person from one place to another in the same way? A person? Cried Mr. Wonka. Are you off your rocker? But could it be done? Good heavens, child! I really don't know. I suppose it could. Yes, I'm pretty sure it could. Of course it could. I wouldn't like to risk it, though. It might have some very nasty results. But Mike TV was already off and running. The moment he heard Mr. Wonka sing, "I'm pretty sure it could," of course it could. He turned away and started running as fast as he could towards the other end of the room where the great camera was standing. Look at me! He shouted as he ran. I'm going to be the first person in the world to be sent by television. No, 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 no! Cried Mr. Wonka. Mike! Screamed Mrs. TV. Stop! Come back! You'll be turned into a million tiny pieces. But there is no stopping Mike TV now. The crazy boy rushed on, and when he reached the enormous camera, he jumped straight for the switch. Scattering Oompa Loompas right and left as he went. See you later, alligator! He shouted, and he pulled down the switch. And as he did so, he leaped out into the full glare of the mighty lens. There was a blinding flash. Then, there was silence. Then Mrs. TV ran forward, but she stopped dead in the middle of the room, and she stood there. She stood staring at the place where her son had been, and her great red mouth opened wide, and she screamed, "He's gone! He's gone!" He's gone. Let's go check the television. See what we get. Great heavens! He has gone. Shouted Mr. TV. Mr. Wonka hurried forward and placed a hand gently on Mrs. TV's shoulder. "We shall have to hope for the best," he said. "We must pray that your little boy will come out unharmed at the other end." Mike! Screamed Mrs. TV, clasping her head in her hands. "Where are you?" "I'll tell you where he is." Said Mr. TV, "He's whizzing around above our heads in a million tiny pieces." Don't talk about it," wailed Mrs. TV. "We must watch the television set," said Mr. Wonka. "He may come through any moment." Mr. and Mrs. TV and Grandpa Joe and Little Charlie and Mr. Wonka all gathered round the television and stared tensely at the screen. The screen. Was quite blank. He's taking a heck of a long time to come across," said Mr. TV, wiping his brow. "Oh dear, oh dear," said Mr. Wonka. "I do hope that no part of him gets left behind." I sure hope no part of him gets left behind. What on earth do you mean?" asked Mr. TV sharply. "What do you mean?" "I don't wish to alarm you." Said Mr. Wonka, but it does sometimes happen that only about half the little pieces 
find their way into the television set. Well, sometimes only half the little pieces find their way through. It happened last week. I don't know why, but the result was that only half a bar of chocolate came through. Mrs. TV let out a scream of horror. You mean only half of Mike is coming back to us? She cried. Let's hope it's the top half," said Mr. TV. "Hold everything," said Mr. Wonka. "Watch the screen. Something's happening." The screen had suddenly begun to flicker. Then some wavy lines appeared. Mr. Wonka adjusted one of the knobs, and the wavy lines went away. And now, very slowly, the screen began to get brighter and brighter. Here he comes! Yelled Mr. Wonka. Yes, that's him, all right. Is he all in one piece? Cried Mrs. TV. I'm not sure," said Mr. Wonka. "It's too early to tell." Faintly at first, but becoming clearer and clearer every second, the picture of Mike TV appeared on the screen. He was standing up and waving at the audience. And grinning from ear to ear, but he's a midget! Shouted Mr. TV. Mike! Cried Mrs. TV. Are you all right? Are there any bits of you missing? Is he going to get any bigger? Shouted Mr. TV. Talk to me, Mike! Cried Mrs. TV. Say something. Tell me you're all right. A tiny little voice. No louder than the squeaking of a mouse came out of the television set. Hi, Mum. It said, "Hi, Pop. Look at me. I'm the first person ever to be sent by television." Grab him, ordered Mr. Wonka. Quick. Somebody grab him. <laughs> Mrs. TV shot out a hand. And picked the tiny figure of Mike TV out of the screen. Hooray! cried Mr. Wonka. He's all in one piece. He's completely unharmed. Oh, thank heavens! He's completely unharmed. You call that unharmed? Snapped Mrs. TV, peering at the little speck of a boy who was now running to and fro across the palm of her hand, waving his pistols in the air. Unharmed? What are you talking about? He was certainly not more than an inch tall. He shrunk," said Mr. TV. "Of course he shrunk," said Mr. Wonka. "What did you expect?" "This is terrible," wailed Mrs. TV. What are we going to do? And Mr. TV said, "We can't send him back to school like this. He'll get trod upon. He'll get squashed. He won't be able to do anything." Cried Mrs. TV. "Oh yes, I will!" Squeaked the tiny voice of Mike TV. "I'll still be able to watch television." Never again! Shouted Mr. TV. I'm throwing the television set right out the window the moment we get home. I've had enough of television. When he heard this, Mike TV flew into a terrible tantrum. He started jumping up and down on the palm of his mother's hand, screaming and yelling and trying to bite her fingers. I want to watch television. He squeaked. I want to watch television. I want to watch television. I want to watch television. <laughs> Here, give him to me," said Mr. TV, and he took the tiny boy and shoved him into the breast pocket of his jacket and stuffed a handkerchief on top. Squeals and yells came from inside the pocket, and the pocket shook as the furious little prisoner fought to get out. Let me. Oh, Mr. Wonka," wailed Mrs. TV. "How can we make him grow?" "Well," said Mr. Wonka, 
stroking his beard and gazing thoughtfully at the ceiling. I must say that's a wee bit tricky, but small boys are extremely springy and elastic. They stretch like mad. So what we'll do? We'll put him in a special machine I have for testing the stretchiness of chewing gum. Maybe that will bring him back to what he was. Oh, thank you," said Mrs. TV. "Don't mention it, dear lady. How far do you think he'll stretch?" asked Mr. TV. "Maybe miles," said Mr. Wonka. "Who knows? But he's going to be awfully thin." Everything gets thinner when you stretch it. You mean like chewing gum? Asked Mr. TV. Exactly. How thin will he be? Asked Mrs. TV anxiously. I haven't the foggiest idea, said Mr. Wonka. And it doesn't really matter anyway, because we'll soon fatten him up again. All we have to do is give him a triple overdose of my wonderful super vitamin candy. Super vitamin candy contains huge amounts of vitamin A and vitamin B. It also contains vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin F, vitamin G, vitamin I, vitamin J, vitamin K, vitamin L, vitamin M, vitamin N, vitamin O. Vitamin P, vitamin Q, vitamin R, vitamin T, vitamin U, vitamin V, vitamin W, vitamin X, vitamin Y, and believe it or not, vitamin Z. Yeah, I probably said that. Mhm. No, 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 no. Mo pato so. The only two vitamins it doesn't have in it are vitamin S because it makes you sick, and vitamin H because it makes you grow horns out the top of your head like a bull. But it does have in it a very small amount of the rarest and most magical vitamin of them all, vitamin Wonka. And what will that do to him? Asked Mister TV anxiously. It'll make his toes grow out until they're as long as his fingers. Oh no! Cried Missus TV. Don't be silly," said Mister Wonka. "It's most useful." He'll be able to play the piano with his feet, but Mr. Wonka, no arguments, please," said Mr. Wonka. He turned away and clicked his fingers three times in the air. An Oompa Loompa appeared immediately and stood beside him. "Follow these orders," said Mr. Wonka, handing the Oompa Loompa a piece of paper on which he had written full instructions. And you'll find the boy in his father's pocket. Off you go. Goodbye, Mr. TV. Goodbye, Mrs. TV. And please don't look so worried. They all come out in the wash, you know. Every one of them. Mom, I am so scared of Mr. Wonka by the fact that he is so not concerned about anything that has happened to any of the children so far. <laughs> He talks about it as if it happens every day. Like, oh, no juicer in the juicing room. Smiles, mom. Oh, they'll stretch him out until he becomes a pancake. Then, when you see it, it's like a thin thread going through. Mhm. Gum, like going through. Thin thread going through. He's just like, oh. At the end of the room, the Oompa Loompas around the giant camera. Were already beating their tiny drums and beginning to jog up and down to the rhythm. There they go again," said Mr. Wonka. "I'm afraid you can't stop them singing." Little Charlie caught Grandpa Joe's hand, and the two of them stood beside Mr. Wonka in the middle of the long, bright room, listening to the Oompa Loompas. And this is what they sang. Every single time. The most important thing. The most important thing we've learned, so far as children are concerned, is never, never, never let them near your television set. Or better still, just don't install the idiotic thing at all. In almost every house we've been, we've watched them gaping at the screen. They loll and slop and lounge about and stare until their eyes pop out. 
Last week, in someone's place, we saw a dozen eyeballs on the floor. They sit and stare and stare and sit until they're hypnotized by it. Until they're absolutely drunk with all that shocking, ghastly junk. Oh yes, we know it keeps them still. They don't climb out the window still. They never fight or kick or punch. They leave you free to cook the lunch and wash the dishes in the sink. But did you ever stop to think, to wonder just exactly what this does to your beloved tot? It rots the senses in the head. It kills imagination dead. It clogs and clutters up the mind. It makes a child so dull and blind. He can no longer understand a fantasy, a fairyland. Beans. <laughs> His brain becomes as soft as cheese. His powers of thinking rust and freeze. He cannot think. He only sees. All right, you'll cry. All right, you'll say. But if we take the set away, what shall we do to entertain our darling children? Please explain. We'll answer this by asking you what use the darling ones to do. How used they keep themselves contented before this monster was invented? Have you forgotten? Don't you know? We'll say it very loud and slow. They used to read. They'd read and read and read and read, and then proceed to read some more. Great Scott! That Zooks! One half of their lives was reading books. The nursery shelves held books galore. Books cluttered up the nursery floor, and in the bedroom by the bed, more books were waiting to be read. Just how the camel got his hump, and how the monkey lost his rump, and Mister Toad, and bless my soul, there's Mister Rat and Mister Mole. Oh, books! What books they used to know! Those children living long ago. So please, oh please, we beg, we pray, go throw your TV set away. And in its place, you can install a lovely bookshelf on the wall. Then fill the shelves with lots of books, ignoring all the dirty looks, the screams and yells, the bites and kicks, and children hitting you with sticks. Fear not, because we promise you that in about a week or two of having nothing else to do, they'll now begin to feel the need of having something good to read. And once they start, oh boy, oh boy! You watch the slowly growing joy that fills their hearts. They'll grow so keen. They'll wonder what they'd ever seen in that ridiculous machine, that nauseating, foul, unclean, repulsive television screen. And later, each and every kid will love you more for what you did. P.S. Regarding Mike TV, we very much regret that we shall simply have to wait and see. If we can get him back his height, but if we can't, it serves him right. Which room shall it be next? Said Mr. Wonka, as he turned away and darted into the elevator. Come on, hurry up! We must get going. And how many children are there left now? How many children are left? Little Charlie looked at Grandpa Joe. And Grandpa Joe looked back at Little Charlie, but Mr. Wonka, Grandpa Joe called after him, "There's, there's only Charlie left now." Mr. Wonka, Charlie is the only one left now. Mr. Wonka swung round and stared at Charlie. There was silence. Charlie stood there, holding tightly onto Grandpa Joe's hand. You mean you're the only one left, Mr. Wonka said, pretending to be surprised. Why, yes, whispered Charlie. Yes. You mean you're the only one? Yes. Mr. Wonka suddenly exploded with excitement. But my dear boy, he cried out, "That means you've won!" Oh, my dear boy! But that means you've won. He rushed out of the elevator and started shaking Charlie's hand so furiously it nearly came off. Oh, I do congratulate you! I really do. I'm absolutely delighted. Oh, I do congratulate you! He cried. I really do. 
I'm absolutely delighted. It couldn't be better. How wonderful this is! I had a hunch, you know, right from the beginning. That is, it was going to be you. I had a hunch, you know, right from the beginning. Well done. Well done, Charlie. Well done. This is terrific. Now the fun is really going to start. But we must in Dilly. We must in Dally. There's even less time to lose now than there was before. We have an enormous number of things to do before the day is out. And we mustn't dilly or dally because we have an enormous number of things to do before the day's out. Just think of the arrangements that have to be made, and the people we have to fetch. But luckily for us, we have the great glass elevator to speed things up. But luckily for us, we have the great glass elevator to speed things. Jump in, my dear Charlie. Jump in. You too, Grandpa Joe, sir. No, no. After you. That's the way. Now then. This time I shall choose the button we are going to press. Mr. Wonka's bright, twinkling blue eyes rested for a moment on Charlie's face. Something crazy is going to happen now, Charlie thought. But he wasn't frightened. He wasn't even nervous. He was just terrifically excited, and so was Grandpa Joe. The old man's face was shining with excitement. As he watched every move that Mr. Wonka made, Mr. Wonka was reaching for a button high up on the glass ceiling of the elevator. Charlie and Grandpa Joe both craned their necks to read what it said on the little label beside the button. It said, "Up and out, up and out." Thought Charlie, "What sort of room is that?" Up and out. What kind of room is that? Mr. Wonka pressed the button. The glass doors closed. Hold on! cried Mr. Wonka. Hold on. Then wham! The elevator shot straight up like a rocket. Yippee! shouted Grandpa Joe. Charlie was clinging to Grandpa Joe's legs, and Mr. Wonka was holding onto a strap from the ceiling. And up they went, up, 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 straight up this time, with no twistings or turnings. And Charlie could hear the whistling of the air outside as the elevator went faster and faster. Yippee! Shouted Grandpa Joe again. Yippee! Here we go! Faster! Cried Mr. Wonka, banging the wall of the elevator with his hand. Faster! Faster! If we don't go any faster than this, we shall never get through. Oh my goodness! We're gonna need to go much faster, otherwise we'll just never break through. Through what? Shouted Grandpa Joe. What have we got to get through? Aha!、Uh -huh. Cried Mr. Wonka, "You wait and see. I've been longing to press this button for years, but I've never done it until now." Break through what? I've been longing to press that button for years. <laughs> I was tempted many times. Oh yes, I was tempted, but I couldn't bear the thought of making a great big hole in the roof of the factory. Here we go, boys, up and out. But you don't mean. Shouted Grandpa Joe, "You don't really mean that this elevator." Well, here we go, up and out. What do you really mean? Oh yes, I do," answered Mr. Wonka. "You wait and see, up and out." Yeah, I do. But, but, but it's made of glass," shouted Grandpa Joe. "It'll break into a million pieces." I suppose it might," said Mr. Wonka. Cheerful as ever, but it's pretty thick glass all the same. But it's made of glass. It'll smash into a million pieces. <laughs> the elevator rushed on, going up and up and up, faster and faster and faster. Then suddenly, crash! And the most tremendous noise of splintering wood and broken tiles. Came from directly above their heads, and Grandpa Joe shouted, "Help! 
It's the end. We're done for. And Mr. Wonka said, "No, we're not. We're through. We're out." Sure enough, the elevator had shot right up through the roof of the factory and was now rising into the sky like a rocket. And the sunshine was pouring in through the glass roof. In five seconds, they were a thousand feet up in the sky. The elevator's gone mad! Shouted Grandpa Joe. Have no fear, my dear sir," said Mr. Wonka calmly, and he pressed another button. The elevator stopped. It stopped and hung in midair, hovering like a helicopter, hovering over the factory and over the very town itself, which lay spread up below them like a picture postcard. Looking down through the glass floor on which he was standing, Charlie could see the small, faraway houses and the streets and the snow that lay thickly over everything. It was eerie and frightening to be standing on clear glass high up in the sky. It made you feel that you weren't standing on anything at all. Are we all right? cried Grandpa Joe. How does this thing stay up? Candy power, said Mr. Wonka. One million candy power. Oh look! He cried, pointing down. There go the other children. They're returning home. The other children go home. We must go down and take a look at our little friends before we do anything else," said Mr. Wonka. He pressed a different button, and the elevator dropped lower. And soon it was hovering just above the entrance gates to the factory. Looking down now. Charlie could see the children and their parents standing in a little group just inside the gates. I can only see three, he said. Who's missing? I expect it's Mike TV, Mr. Wonka said, but he'll be coming along soon. Do you see the trucks? Mr. Wonka pointed to a line of gigantic covered vans parked in a line nearby. Yes. Charlie said, "What are they for? Don't you remember what it said on the golden ticket? Every child goes home with a lifetime supply of candy. There's one truckload for each of them, loaded to the brim." Aha! Mr. Wonka went on, "There goes our friend Augustus Gloop. Do you see him? He's getting into the first truck with his mother and father." You mean he's really all right? Asked Charlie, astonished. Even after going up that awful pipe, he's very much all right," said Mr. Wonka. "He's changed," said Grandpa Joe, peering down through the glass wall of the elevator. "He used to be fat, now he's thin as a straw." "Of course he's changed," said Mr. Wonka, laughing. He got squeezed in the pipe, don't you remember? And look, there goes Miss Violet Beauregard, the great gum chewer. It seems as though they managed to deduce her after all. I'm so glad, and how healthy she looks, much better than before. But she's purple in the face, cried Grandpa Joe. So she is, said Mr. Wonka. Ah, well. There's nothing we can do about that. Good gracious! cried Charlie. You're much more flexible now. Yes, but you're blue. Now he's skinny after going through the pipe. He got 제일 성공했네. He succeeded very much. 그렇지. And look, look, look at this. Look at this. He needs new pants. Look at poor Verica Salt and Mr. Salt and Mrs. Salt. They're simply covered with garbage. And here comes Mike TV," said Grandpa Joe. "Good heavens! What have they done to him? He's about ten feet tall and thin as a wire."
They've overstretched him on the gum stretching machine," said Mr. Wonka. "How very careless! But how dreadful for him!" cried Charlie. "Nonsense," said Mr. Wonka. "He's very lucky. Every basketball team in the country will be trying to get him." <laughs> But now he added, "It is time we left these four silly children." I have something very important to talk to you about, my dear Charlie. Mr. Wonka pressed another button, and the elevator swung upwards into the sky. Charlie's Chocolate Factory. The great glass elevator was now hovering high over the town. Inside the elevator stood Mr. Wonka, Grandpa Joe, and little Charlie. How I love my chocolate factory," said Mr. Wonka, gazing down. Then he paused, and he turned around and looked at Charlie with a most serious expression on his face. "Do you love it too, Charlie?" he asked. "Oh yes," cried Charlie. "I think it's the most wonderful place in the whole world." "I'm very pleased to hear you say that," said Mr. Wonka. Looking more serious than ever, he went on staring at Charlie. Yes, he said, "I am very pleased indeed to hear you say that, and now I shall tell you why." Mr. Wonka cocked his head to one side, and all at once the tiny twinkling wrinkles of a smile appeared around the corners of his eyes, and he said, "You see, my dear boy." I have decided to make you a present of the whole place. As soon as you are old enough to run it, the entire factory will become yours. Charlie stared at Mr. Wonka. Grandpa Joe opened his mouth to speak, but no words came out. It's quite true, Mr. Wonka said, smiling broadly. Now, I really am giving it to you. That's all right, isn't it? Giving it to him," gasped Grandpa Joe. "You must be joking." "I'm not joking, sir. I'm deadly serious." "But, but why should you want to give your factory to little Charlie?" "Listen," Mr. Wonka said. "I'm an old man. I'm much older than you think. I can't go on forever. I've got no children of my own." No family at all. So who is going to run the factory when I get too old to do it myself? Someone's got to keep it going, if only for the sake of the Oompa Loompas. Mind you, there are thousands of clever men who would give anything for the chance to come in and take over from me. But I don't want that sort of person. I don't want a grown-up person at all. A grown-up won't listen to me. He won't learn. He will try to do things his own way and not mine. So I have to have a child. I want a good, sensible, loving child, one to whom I can tell all my most precious candy-making secrets while I am still alive. So that is why you sent out the golden tickets," cried Charlie. "Exactly," said Mr. Wonka. I decided to invite five children to the factory, and the one I liked the best at the end of the day would be the winner. But Mr. Wonka," stammered Grandpa Joe, "do you really and truly mean that you were giving the whole of this enormous factory to little Charlie? After all, there's no time for arguments," cried Mr. Wonka. "We must go at once and fetch the rest of the family." Charlie's father and his mother and anyone else that's around, they can all live in the factory from now on. They can all help run it until Charlie is old enough to do it by himself. Where do you live, Charlie? Where do you live? Charlie peered down through the glass elevator at the snow-covered houses that lay below. It's over there, he said, pointing. It's that little cottage right on the edge of the town, the tiny little one. Right over there, that little house. I see it," cried Mr. Wonka, 
Andy pressed some more buttons, and the elevator shot down towards Charlie's house. "I'm afraid my mother won't come with us," Charlie said sadly. "Why ever not? Because she won't leave Grandma Josephine and Grandma Georgina and Grandpa George. But they must come too." "They can't," Charlie said. "They're very old, and they haven't been out of bed for twenty years." Then we'll take the bed along as well, with them in it," said Mr. Wonka. "There's plenty of room in this elevator for a bed." "You couldn't get the bed out of the house," said Grandpa Joe. "It won't go through the door." "You mustn't despair," cried Mr. Wonka. "Nothing is impossible. You watch." <laughs> the elevator was now hovering over the roof of the bucket's little house. What are you going to do? cried Charlie. I'm going right on in to fetch them," said Mr. Wonka. "How?" asked Grandpa Joe. "Through the roof," said Mr. Wonka, pressing another button. "No!" shouted Charlie. "Stop!" shouted Grandpa Joe. Crash went the elevator right down through the roof of the house into the old people's bedroom. Showers of dust. And broken tiles, and bits of wood, and cockroaches, and spiders, and bricks, and cement went raining down on the three old ones who were lying in bed, and each of them thought that the end of the world was come. Grandma Georgina fainted. Grandma Josephine dropped her false teeth. Grandpa George put his head under the blanket, and Mister and Missus Bucket came rushing in from the next room. Save us! cried Grandma Josephine. Calm yourself, my darling wife," said Grandpa Joe, stepping out of the elevator. "It's only us." Mother cried Charlie, rushing into Mrs. Bucket's arms. Mother, mother, listen to what's happened. We're all going back to live in Mister Wonka's factory, and we're going to help him to run it. And he's given it all to me, and and and. What are you talking about? said Mrs. Bucket. Just look at her house! cried poor Mr. Bucket. It's in ruins. My dear sir said Mr. Wonka, jumping forward and shaking Mr. Bucket warmly by the hand. I'm so very glad to meet you. You mustn't worry about your house. From now on, you're never going to need it again, anyway. Who is this crazy man? Screamed Grandma Josephine, "He could have killed us all." This said Grandpa Joe is Mister Willy Wonka himself. It took quite a time for Grandpa Joe and Charlie to explain to everyone exactly what had been happening to them all day, and even then they all refused to ride back to the factory in the elevator. "I'd rather die in my bed!" shouted Grandma Josephine. So would I," cried Grandma Georgina. "I refuse to go," announced Grandpa George. "Oh my God, he's pushing the bed into the elevator." So Mr. Wonka and Grandpa Joe and Charlie, taking no notice of their screams, simply pushed the bed into the elevator. They pushed Mr. and Mrs. Bucket in after it. Then they got in themselves. Mr. Wonka pressed a button. The doors closed. Grandma Georgina screamed, and the elevator rose up off the floor and shot through the hole in the roof, out into the open sky. Charlie climbed onto the bed and tried to calm the three old people who were still petrified with fear. "Please don't be frightened," he said. "It's quite safe." And we're going to the most wonderful place in the world. Charlie's right," said Grandpa Joe. "Will there be anything to eat when we get there?" asked Grandma Josephine. "I'm starving. The whole family is starving." "Anything to eat?" cried Charlie, laughing. "Oh, you just wait and see." The end. Ha ha ha.